So hi, Jim. Uh, great to have you here. Um, can you let our audience and our community know what you do by day? Are you a superhero? Uh, are you uh, an artist? Are you, uh, well, yeah, what do, what do you do? So I work actually in an office that happens to be right over there, right next door, called the Technology Licensing Office. It's a part of MIT that supports the, uh, the community. It builds on uh, all of the research, the m billions of dollars of research that go on, goes on at MIT every year, and the new inventions that come out of that to try to move those technologies out of the university in, into the hands of people who will develop them to benefit the public. Great. So let me ask you a few uh, about a few case studies. So quantum dots, um, you know, flat screen TVs, you know, they're used all over the place. Uh, there was a technology called quantum dots that, that helped make them brighter, better. I think Vlad Bulovich, and I, I know his co-founder who's now in charge of advanced research at Apple. Uh, I was with him the other day, couldn't tell me a, a thing that he was working on. Um, what was it like working with that team and, and, and how did you help them have impact and go to scale and, and really get this technology in all the screens that, 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 that they are now today? So, so the legwork that the licensing office um, assists with is actually bef as the technology is being developed, as uh, in that case, for example, many inventions are being created that build on top of one another and create a whole portfolio of technologies that are then very powerful. We work with the inventors over a number of years to understand how they'd like to see these technologies commercialize, what their view of the market is. We do some research and, and then develop a plan as to whether uh, the technology gets spun out through a startup, one or more startups, whether the technology gets spun out through uh, a license to an existing company, or maybe for different applications. It could be all of these things. The quantum dots, in fact, have gone into displays most prominently, probably this one, as a, as a backlight technology to make really good colors. It's also gone into biological imaging uh, as a very pure, almost laser-like, microscopic source of, of light. Great. Uh, let me give you another scenario. Uh, so we know of robots. Uh, the the uh, Kendall Square area is, is known for uh, you know, doing innovative things with robotics. Uh, you worked on a project that had a robot that went through pipes to detect uh, cracks and it was a real safety issue, especially in the developing world. Uh, talk about that example and, and what did your office do to help uh, ensure that it could have impact? Sure. So the quantum dot technology was one that's been around for decades and in fact is now a mature technology and, and really penetrating markets very, very broadly and will become a state of the art. Um, this robotic technology is, in, is at the earlier stage that I mentioned where I've worked with the inventors for a couple of years. There's, there've been actually two generations of very entrepreneurial graduate students and postdocs who've moved the technology along and actually uh, tested it in the field in applications to find um, small water leaks in water distribution uh, systems literally around the world in four or five different countries. It's, a, it's a relatively unknown problem that uh, as much as 50% of the water that goes into a municipal water system never comes out the pipes at the other end because of leaks. And it's generally accepted that on the order of 15 to 25% is routine all around the world, even with relatively new infrastructures. So this is now a company that will be spun out um, as we speak within weeks or months and will then go through the process of raising funding, establishing exactly what their business model will be. We help them by licensing, uh, a port again, a portfolio of technologies that will contribute to this and then will be developed further with the know-how and the market know-how of these young entrepreneurs to distribute it uh, both in this country and around the world. So that's a case that you handled. Yes. And your team handles about 800 to 1,000 cases a year. Yes. And the top research universities all have uh, this kind of office doing this type of stuff. Um, Technology so transfer is a field that's evolved so that virtually every university has some size office. Yeah. 
So last example, and then I have a few um, like quick questions. So um, you know, people have been talking about maglev and trains that could float, uh, and I uh, I think there's a team that you've been working with on a case on on floating magnets. Talk a little bit about your role and what the opportunity is, and and how you help them shape it. I mean, to me, this technology isn't tomorrow. This is technology that is not going to be applicable for a little bit. And and w how what are you doing there? Sure. So, so this is now talking about a technology that is coming out of the Plasma Science Fusion Center at MIT. Literally, probably a half a billion dollars of research over the last several decades, particularly on superconducting magnets that have uh, particularly unique properties over what has been known in the past. Um, and this technology has reached a point um, in the last few years that a project uh, sort of a Skunk Works project was started. Think about how this might be commercialized to bring a practical um, uh, green energy source of fusion energy to the world, to the planet. Uh, it's something that was, it's a company was spun out in March with substantial investments from both, interestingly enough, the petroleum, the petrochemicals industry, as well as really far uh, looking uh, investors uh, around the country and around the world. Uh, it's called uh, Commonwealth Fusion Systems, and they're they're working still closely with MIT, but and then Dennis's company. That's right. Yeah, who Dennis was White was a speaker on this red dot uh, in 2012 when he was running the the plasma lab. Um, so in terms of those three, you know, a lot of people who came today they were excited about the theme emerging technologies. You know, the world is changing. Are, are you guys changing with it, given that, that uh, you know, technologies and combinations of, of uh, exponential, you know, uh, technologies are, are uh, you know, cropping up all around us? We, we, we yes, <laughs> simple answer. We change a lot of different ways. In the 12 years that I've been working at the technology licensing office, there have been waves that have uh, risen and then subsided in terms of, focus of the research, which then is the focus of our business, because that's the expertise that we need to sort of help move the technologies out. Um, you know, when I first came, it was the beginning of the MIT Energy Initiative, which funded probably hundreds of millions of dollars over the last decade in research on campus, both for clean energy and even it advances to the petroleum industry. Um, you can see around Kendall Square and the vibrance that we're talking about here, all the life sciences companies, and clearly uh, a lot of the focus on that is on CRISPR technology and those kinds of advances. Um, the, the newest one that I predict will be a, a great uh, effort at MIT and other universities will be artificial intelligence. Uh, the AI world is, is bringing a lot of money to fund research at campus money on campus creates new inventions, and then we work the, with the creators of those inventions to figure out the best way of commercializing so, it. So Jim, my observation, other research universities make it hard sometimes to license, and I feel like MIT makes it easier, but in doing so, it helps these uh, ideas get escape velocity and be able to have impact, and then a cut of it comes back to the university. Um, you know, I look at Sergey and Larry, when they created Google, they didn't go through their licensing office at Stanford, but then they've given back to Stanford later. Is that a model that um, you know uh, is a threat to your model, or it's different? And, and what do you see some of the trends with Apple and China, you know, trying to commercialize things? How does that impact you know how how you guys play? There's eight questions there. <laughs> <laughs> then I can answer any of them. C certainly, the back door isn't a preferred model as far as we're concerned. Uh, that there wouldn't be much of a role for us, and generally. Uh, MIT is a, is a pretty open and honest place and has very clear policies as to what technology, what, what determines whether a technology is owned by MIT and what determines whether a technology is free to go out and be developed by the inventors or other people w without any kind of license. Certainly when, when technology is licensed and revenue comes back to MIT, uh, that revenue is shared with the inventors first and then with the inventors departments uh, and with the general MIT funds. At the end of the year, we just closed our fiscal year. 
at the end of the year, actually, we have a zero on our bottom line, and we start again, dependent on how our licenses do and how we support them uh, and, how, and what new licenses we get done. The last question, but before I do, often when I work with speakers, I say, what's in it for the audience? You know, tell the audience what's in it for them. So I think what's in it for them to understand your role and your team's role is if you're an MIT student or a, a faculty or starting a company with, with any combination of those, if the work is done on campus, if they work with you, good things can happen. It can be a win-win. Um, and uh, so I'm glad, you know, I'm putting a face to one of the, the leaders of, of the, the technology transfer office at MIT. My, my last uh, uh, question to you. So a university like MIT gets billions, maybe multiple billions, from uh, alumni, from government, from foundations, uh, from tuition. Uh, are you helping to ensure that the money that comes into MIT is able to facilitate innovation and impact and, and you know, being deployed uh, across, across the world? At the MIT Media Lab years ago was demo or die, just you know, work for when the demo happens. But are you ensuring that uh, you know, these innovations really uh, can resonate and, and, and make the world a better place? We do, we do that by working with the inventors well before even some of these hopefully groundbreaking technologies are created so that they understand what resources are available in the rich ecosystem here in Kendall Square and at MIT uh, that supports entrepreneurial activities, supports them thinking about starting companies, actually starting those companies, and even after they've done that, something like the engine up in Central Square which is supporting some of the companies that have started in the area, not just from MIT, but many of them What's from MIT. About the engine is that they've raised $200 million and they have like 13 startups and they're gonna grow to like 80, but I think they want tough tech, things that uh, can't be um, you know, done like Angry Bird and, and be real quick, but things that can uh, uh, be done that others aren't trying to do and really have big impact and impact billions. And so I appreciate your work with, uh, with them and, and others. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, the man behind uh, the, the, the technology transfer office here at MIT, if you want to start something, uh, um, can, can people find you? Uh, Please come see us. Yes. Just next door. Yeah, all right, great, thank you.